Hello, welcome to the August 3rd, 2021 Club Cubase live stream. Uh, we'll get started here in just a couple of moments. So I'm just going to do a quick audio test to make sure everything is coming through as expected. Okay, so audio seems to be working fine on my end on my monitoring computer. Uh, my name is Greg Undo. I'm going to be the host for the live stream today. Uh, if you have not attended a live stream before, how it works is you could ask questions in the chat field or submit questions in advance to Club Cubase at Steinberg.de. Um, I, my, once again, my name is Greg Undo. I work as a product specialist for Yamaha Corporation of America, uh, which is the United States distributor for Steinberg products. And I work as kind of a, uh, just a product specialist, primarily focusing on Steinberg products. And I'm presenting from outside of Washington, DC area in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, if you're watching the stream live, please feel free to go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Uh, so just a couple of little things with the live stream. So uh, my family is at home, so you may I may get interrupted by my son. Um, so I apologize in advance for any interruptions. I may have to turn on a TV show or something for him. You may hear my wife working directly above me uh, as she's on conference calls. Uh, we will try to get through all of the questions that are asked in chronological order uh, in the chat field. We will leave some time at the end for questions that were submitted in advance. So, uh, but as you ask a question, if you could tell w uh, which version of the program uh, you're using, like Cubase Artist, Pro Elements, and which computer operating system, uh, that information sometimes is helpful. We will try to get to the questions chronologically, so asking the question repeatedly uh, in the chat field just kind of slows down the whole process. So if we could try to refrain from doing that, that would be helpful. Uh, we will have a, a, a all of the topics covered in the live stream today will be indexed with timestamps and posted later tonight. If you wanted to search for topics covered in previous live streams, you could go to cubaseindex.com and take a look there as well. So Jan from Stockholm has always been kind enough to compile uh, all of the different topics that have been covered. We also have two moderators. I want to give a, a quick, uh, say a quick thanks to them, for to Agent K and to Jazz Dude so who help out with moderation when needed. And another wonderful resource, uh, in addition to all of the official Steinberg, um, in addition to all the Steinberg resources that are available to learn about Steinberg products, is the Cubase Nation Discord. I know that Jazz Dude uh, is involved with that. So we'll go ahead and uh, you see that we have some questions already kind of starting. So let's go ahead um, and get started. All right, so we have a question. Hello, is there going to be anything about the new authentication system? I'm waiting to install my Pro 11 uh, back once. I don't have to use eLicenser anymore. So I'm not sure, there hasn't been any official announcements. Uh, as soon as there is, I'd be happy to share it with you, but there could be a chance it might be f implemented in future generations of software. So Cubase Pro 11 may still be requiring the e-licensor. I, I don't know for sure, but that's purely speculation on my end. But you know, I think we may see some stuff rolling out, but I haven't been briefed on uh, the latest technologies and the developments of that. But uh, as soon as we know, I'll be, you know, happy to share it with everyone. All right, great to see uh, Filter Freak and great, wonderful to see Daryl and it's great to see you on the Zoom meetup. All right, and Monk Beats and Robbie Bowling from Dallas, Stefan from Sweden. All right, and we have Jan from Stockholm. And we have John Costigan, it's great to see you on the Zoom meetup as well as Sable Winters. Okay. 
Okay, so we have uh, Theodore from London. All right, and we see that Sable Winters is now, uh, she's proud to announce she's joined Cubase Pro 11 crew, so wonderful. Okay, Tim Weinheimer's proud that he's hit the like button early. All right, we have Neurotic Nexus. Great to see you on the live stream as well. Okay, so we have uh, just a quick... Um, okay, so we have just a quick question. Um, it just says, uh, please guide through side chaining. Let me just find it really quick again. Uh, so please guide through side chaining. So we will go ahead and uh, take a look at a side chaining example. So let's take a look at how we could do side chaining. Side chaining is kind of taking one track and using that to <clears throat> apply dynamics on another track. So let's take a look. And it's often used if you do like EDM work, often used in uh, for like kick drum and like a bass synth. So let's say if I have uh, a little project like this. And I want the dynamics of that synth bass to be triggered kind of by what's actually happening here on the kick track. So I'm gonna to go to the synth track here and we could just uh, as an insert, I'm gonna just put the standard compressor. Uh, and then at the top of the inserts, we can activate side chain and then we could click on the side chain setup. And this is where we want to add our side chain source. We could add multiple side chain sources. So I want it to be this kick. Um, so we've now added that side chain source. So now when this kick drum comes in, it's going to trigger the compression uh, on that's on the insert for this particular track. So as we listen to it now, so that's how you could do different side chaining. So once again, uh, you want to. Uh, you know, take one of the tracks, apply compressor, like a compressor or a plugin that has sidechain capability. Once you have that open, activate the sidechain, click on to set up the sidechain, add your sidechain source, and then that's all the routing that you need to do. All right, so we have Avery Music from Tel Aviv and BJ Sound Beats from Denmark. So we have Patty from Tanzania and Melbourne. All right, just. Okay. All right, just reading through different comments. Let's see if I missed any questions so far. I think we got them all. We're still kind of a lot of people introducing themselves. Um, so we see, uh, hello, this is, um, Shaker from Houston, Texas, uh, just purchased complete 13 ultimate and it is loaded on USB three external drive. Cubase 11 pro is very slow at start. Any suggestions? 
Um, so, you know, generally, I, I'm not sure if you're seeing that, uh, that complete 13, if it is still going through maybe scanning uh, different, uh, different content, or if it is, you know, you, you know, it, it'd be interesting to see, you know, generally sometimes as you go through plugins, it may, uh, take a little while for it to go through all the plugins and do different testing for the plugins. Like it, it'll actually do kind of a little quality assurance test and then make sure, that it's uh, working correctly and does like measurement of latency the first time. So, and also depending on your USB 3 external drive, if you're trying to play a lot of content off of that, depending on what's on your USB bus, that could be causing other problems, but you, you may want to check to see if there's any optimum settings for um, you know, if you are running, you know, I think that you could buy, and I'm not a native, native instruments expert, but I think if you buy uh complete 13, you can get it, uh, with, I know, I think you used to be able to get it with a drive. You might, you might be able to still do that. And I think the drive is intended not for sample playback, but for installation. So, um, you know, if you have the capability of trying a different drive or seeing if Cubase starts up without that drive connected much faster, that could kind of indicate that it's the, the native, uh, the complete 13 that could be causing, uh, the slowness on startup that could give you just kind of an indication of what could be doing it. You could isolate it to that and maybe see if there's another drive that might be working uh, better, but if you've in, you know, make sure that you probably install the plugins on your C drive, and you know, at that point, work with the content probably off of your external drive. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, I want to take full length songs off records and sync them to my beats. What is the best way to do this in Cubase? Can you show us an example about this uh, for doing remixes? Okay, so we could have it where the uh, beat is actually matching to the track or you could have the track match to the beat. So you could do it either way. So we'll take a quick look at this. Let me see, I think I have a project that we could use. It's not a myth, it's just load it up here quickly. Go ahead and use this one. Okay, so when we go, let's say we have a like a record or recording like a full song. So let's say this isn't quite correlating to, check my connections here quickly. So let's say we don't really have this particular song locked to a tempo. So what I could do is I'll just come over here and just, So I'm gonna select the song and go to my project menu to tempo detection. So at this point, I'm going to analyze the tempo of the track. And So right now, if I want it to listen, so now we have what the tempo is of the track. So, uh, and when it does this, it's figuring out kind of where the downbeat is and it does it, it'll switch your meter to one four because it's figuring out where the beats are. So you may have to come over here and just say, okay, this is where the downbeat is. 
So as we listen to this, so if I wanted to take a beat and match that beat to the file, I could come over here, just grab some, something maybe from EDM Toolbox. Let's see if we have just some audio files. Looks like mostly MIDI. Okay, so let's say we could audition. So what I'm gonna do is just drag this particular file in and I'm select a file here and make sure that it's in musical mode. So if it's not in musical mode, the, these two files will play back at their original tempo. But if I want that to be synced, all I have to do is place my loop into musical mode. And now as we listen to that, So now we have this beat following the particular tempo of the of the original track. But if we wanted to take the track and let's say if we want this to be a perfectly steady beat instead of these natural musical fluctuations, what I could do is select that event, go to audio and we'll go to advanced and we'll say set definition from tempo. So I will come over here and I'm just gonna, and what this will do is basically embed the tempo changes of every single file into the particular track. So if I now wanted to play this back at, let's say 140 beats a minute where there is no fluctuations in time. As I do this, now it's gonna play back perfectly steady. And I could just come over here and just type in whatever tempo that I want. And this way you could have the existing music track match to the beats or have the beats match to the existing music track. So do a tempo detection that will give you the tempo. You may have to define a downbeat in the signature track, which will automatically be added. And then as you drop in a loop, make sure that that loop is in musical mode and that will automatically follow the tempo changes that are input here. And if you needed the, the original audio file to match the loop, select that file, go to audio, to advanced, to set definition from tempo. And then it will be like, you know, extremely accurate, hyper accurate, if you will. And then this will, as this is speeding up and slowing down, we could just have this be one steady, consistent tempo. So a couple of different approaches you could take for that. All right, thanks for all the great questions. Okay, so we have a question uh, from Christian D68. Uh, Hello, Greg. In supervision in a multi-correlation window, I have some frequencies going down in red instead of up in blue. Does this mean I have phase problems? What can I do? So let me just jump back to another project here. We'll take a look at. So let's say as we're playing. So I go to my control room and let's say I want to open up the multi-correlation here. All right, so this is our multi-correlation meter. So with some, it's a project I did, but if you see, 
what this is showing is going to be different frequency ranges, like the particular frequencies that are out of phase. And it's pretty normal to see just, you know, to see some of the frequencies here. But this is more, you know, it, it could be, you know, I would worry more about like these frequency meters, like these phase meters here. But if you do have phase issues, this could show you and kind of point you to the direction of the frequencies that have phase issues. So you go, oh, it's kind of in the kick drum frequencies or it's in like where the snare is or the hi-hats or maybe like when the cymbals for the overhead mics that every time there's a cymbal crash that the overhead mics picks up, I see a little spike in red here. So that may mean that you could, you know, isolate and find those particular frequencies. So it's okay to have some of your files uh, to have those frequencies, uh, like some frequencies to be out of phase, but it's really meant as more of a diagnostic tool. Like if you see like, you know, the vast majority of your frequencies in the red, uh, as we look at it, then I would be concerned and try to fix it in the mix. If it's predominantly in the blue with a couple in the red, you know, that's going to be okay. So. All right, great to see Michael Pierce on a live stream as well as um, as well as Jeff Sabelski from Chico, California. All right, so we have I think Saeed. Uh, hello from Germany. Thank you for your help getting better in Cubase. That's great. Hope I'm glad I could help out a little bit. Okay, uh, so we have a question. Um, when I'm listening to a soundtrack, there's sometimes a familiar loop that a composer adds. Is there any of those uh, in Cubase sample loops? So there's lots of different loops that composers will use. Um, so probably if they're doing more like a you know symphonic piece, maybe not, but I know a lot of people uh, we'll use like one of my, uh, composer friend of mine, he loves using all the Steinberg content and one of his favorite and, uh, that he just used, I think just came out maybe in 10 or 9.5 with groove agent S he came with some new sounds, <clears throat> you know, where he has incredibly tight, uh, deadlines. So I think he uses a lot of laser beams. So if you just wanted to, um, Come here, you know, where you could start off with, you know, different patterns. So there's a lot of kind of content within, uh, like some of the, you know, so if it's more kind of electronic stuff, you know, so like, I think I remember him. I think he used uh, my composer friend, like he did a whole campaign for Revlon. And I think he ended up just like, you know, and kind of whatever, let's say our tempo, let's say at 120 uh, now. So there's lots of content to explore and, you know, people have taken a lot of time to program these for you and they're all available free to you. So, you know, take a, a different, you know, take a familiarize yourself with all the different content and you could get a lot of mileage uh, out of it. Okay, so uh, a question for Michael Pierce. Uh, um, 
So it says Greg for all of us that have upgraded to Cubase 11, would you do a quick recap on the fastest way to get settings, plug in library settings across uh, version 10 might be useful. So a lot of times it's gonna automatically carry those things over. If not, what you could do in uh, Cubase, open up your Cubase 10, go to your edit menu and go to profile manager uh, and export your profile. And then in Cubase 11, simply import the profile. And this will be like all your key commands, macros, your routing, all of your VST plugin collections, your global workspaces, all those can be saved and transferred over plus many other uh, all of your track presets, user presets that could all be uh, carried over directly from once again from edit to profile manager and all kind of like your typical Cubase settings will just be migrated directly over. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Jan uh, Panning. Can Greg explain the difference between balance pan and combined pan? Thanks, Jan. Okay, so let's say on my stereo track here, so let's say I'll just play this little classical piece here. So if I, we could switch on a stereo track between two different panners. So I think it will default to the balance panner and this will allow you to say, okay, I want this only in the right speaker or only in the left speaker. But we may want to have a little more control over that. And this is what we could do with our combined panner. So if I want it to be more focused in the center, or if I wanted something to be like a little tighter, but tighter over to the right or tighter to the left. And I wanted to have more, I wanted this to kind of be in both left and right, but more focused on the left or right. If I get it really tight, this works like a balance, but I could s specify how wide that panning will be for the particular tracks. And as we get started here, what else we could do is if I just, in the, com in the combined mode, if I just kind of keep the mouse button held down and keep going up, I could reverse the panning. So if I wanted to swap the left and right channels and automate that, you could do stuff like that very easily. So those are kind of the benefits uh, between the combined panner and the balance panner. All right, wonderful to see Michael Teams from Weatherford, Texas. Okay, uh, all right, so I see from Randy Lee, how do I get my newly purchased Pro 11 to recognize USB E licensor? Says it needs to be transferred. So I think you had a Cubase Elements, Randy, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so probably put the, I would transfer the, so let's say if we go to our license manager system here, um, I would, Come over here and let's say if you have like the soft e-licensor for elements uh, or AI or one of the versions, drag that to the USB e-licensor that will effectively transfer like the Cubase elements license over to the USB e-licensor. At that point, um, you know, when, when you do the upgrade from elements, let's say to pro, it's gonna look to the USB E licensor. So transfer the elements license to the E licensor first. And then once you enter in the activation code, it'll look for that particular license on the USB E licensor. And then that should be able to allow you to get the upgrade to the pro version.
Okay, so we have a question. Uh, when I save an existing project and using save as, how can I change the recording path, uh, the audio path? So anytime that you, if you wanted to record to a new folder, um, like if you, at that point, what you could do is uh, select the tracks that you want to record and you could set the record folder and then you could manually set it. So if, you know, or if you want it to simply come over to your media menu, let's go to the media menu and go to the pool. So let's say if we have a number of audio files here, um, you know, we could choose to uh, do a prepare archive. So once you open that up, if you do a prepare archive, that will move all of the files from the previous location uh, to the new location where the project is, where you have the save as, and you could see kind of the path here. So once again, just go uh, to your audio pool and then, you know, you could just select all the files and you know, once you come over here, um, you could just do a pool folder, another method to accomplish the same thing. If you wanted to move all the files to the new uh, location is just choose to do a backup project. Uh, and then you could just put that into a brand new folder and then copy the save as. So generally people would use the save as function for like alternate or just variations within the same pool. But if you wanted to do it, you know, put it to a new location, the fastest way is just do like a backup project. And that will allow you to, um, you know, have the project and all the files needed uh, moved uh, in kind of a few mouse clicks. All right, we see Michael Teams has already started with the ice cream distribution. So always makes the live streams much better. We appreciate it, Michael. All right, wonderful to see Pablo on the live stream from Galicia, España. Just going through. Um, my chat field just kind of jumped on me. Okay, so I think back to where I was. Okay, uh, so we see, uh, hi Greg, I'm running out of room for key switch articulations on an instrument track. Uh, is there a way to easily keep the range of articulations established and move them up or down together for more room? Um, so let's take a look. We just go to project with some expressions on it. So uh, maybe uh, Jeff could answer just if you needed more room in the uh, in the editor or in the inspector. So once you're here, you could just you know go to the inspector to see a number of different articulations. But let's say if we come here to our expression map, um, so there is this little scroll that you could kind of go up and down. Uh, so if you have more than, let's see how many it shows at once, maybe it looks like maybe around 10. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, so we can see kind of 10 at once and you could scroll up and down to see the available articulations and you could always just kind of make um, this taller within the 
a particular edit screen as well. So, but try just to come over here and see if you could just scroll up if you need to see them from the uh, inspector, but you could come over here and see, you know, you could probably see about 40 or 50 pretty easily just when you go to like the full screen editor. So, but Jeff, if you could uh, let us know if it's gonna be for the editor or for the inspector. See Cubase Junkie saying I could look at supervision all day. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, do you have any recommend recommendations for reversing mirroring automation? And is there a way to create new versions of automation lanes on tracks, uh, i.e. volume or panning? So currently we don't have the ability of doing uh, like track versions on automation. So we have kind of track versions on particular tracks, but the automation would be uh, constant because it's not going to be necessarily coupled with the event but let's see if we can maybe invert automation so let's say I just want this to go up uh, see if we can do this maybe with the project logical editor I'm not sure if we can So we could kind of trim it. Um, so I don't know of a way to kind of just invert. Um, so let's say if I have this, these lines set here, I mean, we could just kind of grab the edges and be able to invert kind of like that. Um, so let me just say if that's where we started, but you could so if you grab kind of the right corner, you could if you just kind of grab the corners here, um, that you could kind of invert it that way. Um, and I think that's probably, that's the best way that's coming off the top of my head to kind of change, uh, to invert the automation values is just to go select the automation and go to the upper left or right hand corner and just kind of invert like that. So it may not be perfect, but you could give that a shot. See from Hello World says, my friends think I'm a genius. I just watched this show. So that's good. I won't tell them. Okay, so it's just see a question. Uh, Greg, sometimes when I freeze synths, they end up out of time with the project. Uh, any ideas and does freezing an instrument unload it? 
So yeah, freezing an instrument will unload it from the computer's uh, memory and from the processor. So I've seen sometimes when, uh, you know, I've seen people sometimes when they freeze a track and then they do a tempo change that it may not automatically, if there's any kind of subtle tempo change. I've seen sometimes when freezing a track, uh, if, you know, you may want to try just out of curiosity freezing it. Uh, and if there are effects, maybe if you go to the uh, constrained delay compensation and activate that before freezing it. But I, you know, one of the things I will always kind of recommend is, you know, instead of freezing, which I kind of see is more of a, a 2001 type of technology is just to come over here and just say, okay, I want to do like a render in place. So when you do a render in place, you could have like your render settings. And at this point I could just say, I want these to be like separate events. And I just want the original tracks to always be there and be frozen. So I could just take like those events and we could have them mixed down. Or if I want it to again, come over here to my render in place. Let's go to the render settings and I'll just choose not to mix down. And this will give me just, you know, my audio files that will be the same colors and mute the audio files. And that way you always have the MIDI that you could just simply unmute. You could choose to also, uh, if I select the events here, like instead of the events, but if I select the tracks and we do a render in place, I could just come right over here and we'll say, okay, I want to go to my render settings and I could say, let's disable the source tracks. So I could just select the tracks and then it will disable the original source tracks and you could just have it as audio just kind of that easily. So. So, you know, try using the render in place, um, but you could also, it could be maybe a, you know, if it's con if it's like constantly out by a little bit, it could be maybe a plugin that's on the chain and on the chain, it could also mean that it's going to be going through like master effects processing. So you could try to bypass that or not include the, the, you know, channel settings on the freeze, but check out you know, the render in place. I think it gives you a lot more flexibility. All right. So just see, um, I just bought the CC121 controller. I hope it work will work on Big Sur. So yeah, and we see other people saying that they're running on Big Sur. All right, so we have Brian Sawyer from Beulahville, North Carolina. It's great to see you on the on the Zoom meetup, as well as many other people. It's great to see a lot of new faces. All right. Okay, so we have a question. Um, can I retrieve an arranger track that was previously flattened within a project? All right, so let's go ahead and take a look. I think I have some arranger tracks here. Okay, so let's say I have kind of a ranger track active here. And what the arranger track is, if you're not familiar with it, is you could define different sections of a song and have Cubase play in a non-linear manner. So instead of it going straight on, All right, so now if I wanted to take this particular arrangement that's non-linear and jumping around, we could choose to flatten the chain. Um, so once we flatten the chain, 
We could see now all of the different parts have been defined. Let's come over here to the settings. So I know that you could undo it right after the fact. And usually the default mode under destination is just to create a new project so that it automatically will retain this particular project. Um, but I think once it's been flattened in the new project and if you've saved that it might, uh, let me just take a look. Yeah, so I think once you do that, so that's why the default mode may just uh, give you, um, you know, just the, you know, set to new project so that your original project will always be there. Um, but I think once you've kind of flattened it, you know, that's when a lot of people may do a save as or save a different version of it so that they could go back or just have that automatically uh, flattened to a new project. Sorry about that. I see people says, I want Cubase t-shirt, Greg. So I, I want one too. So 29 years, I deserve a t-shirt. So. Okay, I only want to record vocals. Which version of Cubase should I buy? So, you know, all versions of Cubase will allow you to record vocals. If you're doing a lot of work with vocals, uh, I may recommend getting Cubase Artist because Cubase Artist will allow you to do very audio. So if, you're, if you find that you may be needing to do vocal tuning where you say, okay, I just need to take you know, these and graphically edit the pitch. Um, very, you know, you could get Cubase Artist for that and that will save you a tremendous amount of time for editing and really kind of, you know, fine, you know, those really kind of very detailed edits um, you could do with very audio. So if you're just capturing vocals, like maybe like a podcast or a book on tape, you know, you probably don't need to do vocal correction. You get Cubase elements. But if you're doing like vocals within a song or acapella, I think it's worth jumping up to Cubase artists just to have access to the very audio, which will give you kind of graphic uh, pitch uh, correction. You see from Cubase Junkie, I need to start using the Arranger track more often. All right, so I see the Pablo, I get Porticos for Greg, so I'll, I'll take Porticos. I have the plugins, they're great. All right, wonderful to see David M from uh, Liverpool. Yeah, we missed you on the on the Zoom on Friday, so we're glad you got to celebrate a you know, birthday with your family. That's probably more important. All right, you see the Sable Winters is paying full attention today, so that's great. I'm honored. Okay, so we just have, uh, hi Greg, can you please show how to make an M&E 
stem in Nuendo. So a lot of times people will set up and we'll just go ahead and open up Nuendo here. So an ME is often the music and effects without uh, without dialogue. It's often passed around if you're doing localization. So let me just. Just see if this is going to be a good thing of a different sample rate. Okay, so you know here we could see that we're gonna have like one folder for Vox. This is a pretty uh, typical post-production scenario. Let me see if we can. Check my audio connections here really quick. Okay, so once we kind of have, um, you know, so I, what often happens is like we could see in this case, we're gonna have uh, a folder and often this would go for one for vocals, one for music. We'll have human sound effects, ambiences. So these will all be routed. These folders are often routed to different stems. So as soon as we're here, we can say, okay, I have my music stem, I have my Vox stem, music stem, background stem, sound effects, music, sound effects, and reverb. So if at this point, when we are working uh, directly with, you know, if we need to deliver an m &E, we could just simply deliver everything without our Vox stem and we go to export and let's say we do an export audio mix down at this point I could you know just deliver let's say if we do a multi I could say we want to deliver everything except for our vocal stem or we could mute you know not include all of our different tracks here that would be in folders so that's how you could kind of easily create an M&E. And one of the things that you could do in the monitor source of the control room in Nuendo is you could listen to kind of like the 5.1 output. Uh, and as we do that, we could also just say, I only want to listen to uh, the Vox stem or the music stem, the background stem or the sound effects. And you could have kind of different combinations of these. So if you say, okay, I just wanted to listen to the Vox stem, or I want to listen to everything except the Vox stem, that's how you could do it. So it's often kind of routing through groups for your different, uh, you know, for your music and your effects. And then you could, even in a control room, just kind of bring in and out of, okay, I don't want to hear the vocals and you could hear everything else and you could have your different monitoring sources right there inside of Nuendo. All right, so let's look for... A 
Okay, so we see a uh, from, question from Sable Winters. What to do with old versions of Elements and WaveLab? I need to space. Do I lose those license uh, after upgrades, then removal? So if you have like, you know, Cubase Elements, that version would be upgraded, you know, and you upgrade to like, you know, Cubase Pro. At that point, your, your Cubase Pro license... Um, you know, I think the Cubase Pro license will run Cubase Elements, but it's not necessarily necessary to have Cubase Elements or WaveLab Elements if you have WaveLab Pro on your system. <clears throat> if you're like uh, running out of hard space, uh, running out of. Um, OK, so since you need the space, you could remove them. So you could uninstall the programs, uh, you know, upgrade the licenses, and then just simply, uh, you know, install the the full version, and that will free up some space for you. All right. So we have Greedo Kenobi uh, checking in. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so we see from uh, Rock Five Beats uh, with the new Cubase Eleven Pro update. Uh, it says, uh, "Let's make sure I got audio." Um, uh, with the new Cubase Eleven Pro update, I'm exporting my stems, and when I bypass all my plugins, my stems are still printing with all the effects and plugins on them. Anyone else having this problem? So when you go to the export audio mix down. You know, it may, let's say if we're doing our multiple stems, you know, you'll see like, and this could be a little subtle here, but in under effects, you could just set that to disabled. Uh, so try setting that to disabled because if this is set to like inserts and strip, this will print like your inserts and channel strip or add this the sends and the groups or the master effects processing. So just make sure that once you do your exporting uh, that you come here and if you're doing kind of stems, make sure that you just have the effects set to disabled. So give that a shot and let us know if that makes sense for you. Uh, so question, do you need a license for Halion SE, Pad Shop 2, and Groove Agent? Uh, just bought Cubase 11 Pro, and these three have no content. Cubase works okay. So the license for those instruments uh, is included with uh, Cubase 11 Pro. If you don't see the content, you may just have to go to the Steinberg Download Assistant. I think the new license identity system has just been updated today. Okay, so now that we're in our download, go to the download assistant. I'll just cancel this for now. Okay, so when, and then once you go to Cubase 11 Pro, you know, so if you download like just the, you know, the Cubase application at this stage, you want to just kind of come over here and say, okay, I want Pad Shop 2 recommended. I want all of my Groove Agent content. I want my Halion Sonic SE content. So make sure that you just download those and install them directly from. Uh, the download access code or from the the Steinberg download assistant right there. But but the license for those three plugins is included with your Cubase 11 Pro license.
Okay, so you see from uh, Jeff Sabelski, um, uh, I need to change the range of key switch articulations from A1, A, A minus one to C sharp one to A6 to C sharp eight, for instance, uh, all together. So I have more key switch range for more. Uh, so when you do that, you know, just go to, so if you need to extend the range of the available notes for, you know, I think if you just go to the expression map setup, let me just jump back to this project here quickly. So we go to your expression map setup. You know, I think at this point, let's say, okay, if I go to violin and then if you wanted to just keep adding, you could have, let's see how many slots we could have. So more than 64, so probably 128 slots, I would assume. So once we just come here, All right, so more than 128 slots that are available with all, and then at this point you could just kind of type in whatever note that you want. So if you needed to change the articulations, but make sure that the instruments themselves uh, are cap will respond to the articulations as you uh, enter it in. Okay, so we have a question. Um, when I'm recording electric guitar, it sounds really loud. Is there any way to relaxing this uh, after I record it? Uh, I have a UR22 external audio interface, so I'm not sure if you're recording it um, directly on, like if you're using a microphone on an amp or if you're using a uh, just the guitar directly in. So once, if you needed to kind of adjust the signal, if you go to the mix console here, so I have my, you know, so if you're getting too much gain, you, you can go to your inputs here. And let's say I have a mono in, uh, I'll click on my inputs tab. So let's say, okay, I'm using input one of my UR24C, which is very similar to UR22C. All right, so now I have this signal. So you will have an input channel. So uh, depending on your version of Cubase, but you could just come right over here and attenuate the input channel gain right here. And if you are uh, also, if let's just see. Um, so in, if you have a UR22 Mark II, I think uh, you're, there's three different UR22 interfaces, but depending, you could also just come over, I think you may see under applications. So if it's like a UR22C, I think you could go to like the DSP mix effects software, and then you could adjust the input gain here as well. So that, that's something else that um, you may want to try. But, you know, so if you could let me know if it's like, you know, microphone signal. So, you, you know, you may just if it's, you know, if you're recording a Marshall stack and it's on, you know, and it's dined, you know, that may be more gain than you can pad. So you may have to kind of find a sweet spot of of level going into matching your microphone to matching the input on the mic pre so okay so i just see um I try to edit a uh, long voiceover at twice the speed to save time by putting it in musical mode and increasing tempo. But once I change the tempo back, the edits don't stay together. What am I doing wrong? So it's probably not the best approach 
for that scenario. So what I would probably do is let me just do a new project here. Let's say if I was just doing voice editing, I'll just import an, a quick audio file that has some, some, I think if I was doing some help at ESPN, I got a quick file from them. Okay, so let's say we have so Scott Dixon joining us. Like just a quick voice file here, and um, I think if we go to key commands, you know, because it, I would go to key commands and then you'll see shuttle play. Um, so let's say shuttle play times two. So I have command shift plus space so let's say now i'm playing so scott dixon joining us and now i could just come over here and command shift space and let's see if my control room is main for sports center <laughs> which is i look at this list of all let me just check my audio connections here again really quick See if I just switch this right quickly. All time open wheel champions. And you know, you've moved from that group of three, which is an unbelievable group, into that group of four time champions. It's Mario Andretti, uh, Sebastian Bourdais. So I know a lot of people will do a lot of editing like that. You know, obviously the, the pitch will change, but you know, if you're constantly going back and forth between the tempos and then you edit the tempos, you know, so check out, uh, I would, you know, suggest maybe going into the key commands and look under, I think it's going to be an under transport, but you could do, you know, shuttle play speeds. So if you wanted to do stuff like that, that, you know, you could do this through just, um, you know, different key commands to have that work. So I would try that if you're doing it for editing. Uh, I know Wave Lab has a very specific function. So playback will occur like twice as fast, which is like really well suited for why it's very popular for doing books on tape editing and stuff like that. But I would try that in. Okay, so I just see from uh, Yadin, uh, who had a question about recording the guitar really loud, says, and I'm using Guitar Rig 6 Pro and hearing white noise. Um, so, you know, if you're hearing white noise, sometimes, you know, plugin developers will do that, like for um, some plugins that might be in demo mode. Sometimes, you know, plugins, if you have a trial version, Maybe you know, like you know, every thirty seconds you may hear a burst of white noise or something like that. Um, so make sure you have like the full license for the Guitar Rig Pro Six. But you should be able to adjust the gain. Uh, you know, like a lot of times, even you know, and you could try with, you know, let's say if we're here with an audio track. You know, also just try the built-in, which, which is a, a wonderful guitar amp plug-in. So let's say if we go to your inserts here, go, look under distortion. And most guitar amps, so let's say if you go to the VST amp rack, you know, here you could have, you know, a pre-effect even. So if you wanted to adjust the gain going in before, but you have like your gain just like a traditional... Uh, guitar amp so it could be just probably gain structure within the plugin itself but try to vst amp rack 
uh, and it's a wonderful sounding guitar amp plug and it's kind of uh, underappreciated. All right, wonderful to see uh, Peter joining us. Don't have to worry about being late. All right, reading through comments. Just finding my spot here. Okay, so it just says, uh, Hi Greg, I uh, watched your video on creativity with Arpache to record the MIDI output from Arpache. Unfortunately, I just can't record the MIDI output. Uh, please help, thanks in advance. All right, so let's take a look. I'll just add a quick instrument track. I'll do some retro log. All right, so say I'll just have. All right, so uh, in Arpache, if you're not familiar with it, is a MIDI insert. So all I have to do, let's say I'll go to uh, Arpache here. So I just play, I hold down a chord and turn on our patchy and play the same chord. So let's say if I want this to be maybe 30 second notes long. And I want it to go Okay, so let's say I have this and I wanted to, so if I record just my normal, uh, so I'll just come here and if I record, just give myself a little count in. So when I record normally, I hear the arpeggio, but I'm just holding down a chord and the Arpache plugin is generating the arpeggio. But when I go to look at the event itself, it just shows as one long kind of boring chord. And this chord gets processed through the Arpache plugin. Uh, if I wanted to take that and convert it into what the Arpache is generating it, I could go to MIDI menu to freeze MIDI modifiers. And now it's turned that boring chord directly into the arpeggio that it was processing. If I wanted to instead click here, I could, and this came in maybe version 885, something like that. So now when I go to record, the arpeggiator will be will be embedded in the record just by activating this record icon within the plugin itself. So now when we look at the part, we could see just all of the arpeggiators. I hold the chord down, the arpeggiator being generated by Arpache is then just recorded in real time. 
So give that a shot and uh but it's pretty straightforward once you do that but if you don't see this little record icon then you might have to just select the part and go to freeze midi modifiers in the end All right, so we see Mark is uh, joining from Nairobi. See John Costigan wants people to hit the like button. And if you hit it twice, it undoes your like, so make sure you do it an odd number of times. And if you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that. All right, so we see from Asher's, um, guys, I'm late here. What's the deal with the dongle? Have they gotten rid of it entirely or is something else going on? So Steinberg has announced uh, earlier in the year that they will be migrating to a new licensing system uh, that won't require the USB e-licensor. So that's about all the details that we have currently. All right, so we have a question. When will M1 native Cubase version will be released? Um, so, you know, I think we'll always see more optimizations going on, but there's a lot of components uh, that are using Cubase outside of our control that don't, you know, that may never work natively on an M1 processor. So I don't think we'll see VST2 plugins working natively. So there's lots of third-party components that aren't. So, you know, but, you know, they're always working on kind of better, um, you know, always working on better implementation as time goes on. So, but... All right, so we see from Sven Isaacson, will Steinberg adopt the subscription scam? I know you said they won't, but the fact that they have for Darko, for iPad is cause for concern. So we, uh, you know, Steinberg has been very emphatic with they're not going to be doing a subscription model for, um, you know, for Cubase. And they know that people don't want that. You know, we have some restrictions on stuff that's going to be done only through the, Apple App Store, um, but so I wouldn't think that the Dorco for iPad is cause for concern for your Cubase license, so. Okay, uh, so I just see VST Transit. Uh, friend's shared audio tract is locked. Uh, can I open it? I duplicated it, but cannot open lock. So I think that they would need to unlock the track. Uh, and that's kind of done intentionally so that, you know, certain tracks wouldn't be able to be downloaded and open. So maybe you just have your friend 
uh, unlock the particular track. All right, wonderful to see Uno Memento from Finland. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so I see a question. Uh, what difference does bit rate make? Uh, what's best? You know, we could think of it as, you know, we could think of it, it's just the higher the bit rate, the more information is captured. So I would say if you were doing, you know, like something very with a lot of details, maybe like, you know, think of like a classical recording or Alison Krauss type of recording, that, you know, like really kind of squeaky clean material, the, you know, higher bit depth gives more information, allows you, like as you do edits, it gives more information for interpolation. Uh, the most common bit depth that people use is 24 bit. We, there are now some 32 bit converters. I think Steinberg, uh, the AXR4T was the first 32 bit integer com uh audio interface so you know cubase will capture that but most audio interfaces won't record at that so you know so doing you know and if you a b it it will make a difference in the quality it may not show through if you're doing like a really hardcore house track or a punk rock thing you know you may not notice a huge benefit of 32 bit versus 24 bit versus 16 bit but the most common sample, most common bit depth that people will use is going to be 24 bit. All right, great to see Soren from Sweden and good to see you on the live in the Zoom meetup last Friday. Okay, so I see from uh, Jay from Connecticut, would you be so kind as to share with Yamaha sales that members of the uh, Nuendo slash Cubase VST customer base would love more physically accessible pricing on the Vocaloid uh, software voices? So I'll pass it along. It's kind of a, you know, for a little bit in the US, we were doing, um, we were handling the sales of that, but it's kind of more of a Yamaha specific thing. And it's kind of like a little group within Yamaha that does that. So I actually don't, uh, have any dealings with that, but I'll make sure to mention that to them. Uh, so thanks for the heads up, Jay. I'll, I'll kind of bring it up to their attention. Read through comments. Thanks for all the great questions and discussion. Um, so I just see how would a Cubase 11 user set up something similar to Ableton's effect rack for parallel processing? So I'm not familiar with Ableton's effect rack, but if you you know wanted to do parallel processing, what a lot of people do, you know, is you know once you come over here, you could just okay, you could do it with you know two group tracks, or if you you know so like often with parallel processing. You know, and each group could have its own 16 inserts, or if you load up an effects channel track, you could have, you know, each of these could have eight or 16 inserts within the, uh, 
you know, so once we go to our stereo delay, we could stack 16 different plugins and then we could send, you know, take our sends and send it to our delays or to our groups uh, in varying ways. So one group could be kind of the parallel group. One could be kind of our typical, you know, group. So you could do it kind of like that. But if you could maybe, um, since I'm not familiar with the Ableton rack, uh, you know, with the Ableton, uh, you know, rack concept that you mentioned, the effect rack for parallel processing. But, you know, it's pretty easy just to, let's say, if I want to do a uh, quick parallel processing on drums, you know, I could select these two tracks. And if I wanted to add, um, let's just add two group channels. I could select all of my drums. So let's go to the sends. I'll hold down my alt and shift and say, let's send it to group one. Turn it on, let's send it to group two. Turn it on. So now these will both be just Sorry, I send this to group two. All right, so now I could just come here. Let's go to the channel strip, and now we could just do your. So you could just send parallel that way, but um, but if there's something different, uh, you know, just let me know. I'd be happy to uh, try to replicate it in Cubase for you. Okay, so I see. Hi, Greg. Uh, when using uh, direct offline processing with reverb or delay uh, effects on a region, is there any option to have the effect not get cut when the next region starts? Okay, so let's say if I want to take this guitar part here. Okay, and I wanted to do uh, offline processing just on this, and let's just do something obvious like a flanger okay okay oh, let me just go ahead and i'll replace that with the delay Okay, and I'm just gonna add a tail here on a tail size. So we'll go ahead and listen to it. So when this next region starts, we'll see. So, you know, since this file isn't processed, um, you know, you know, so if you have this, you may just have to move it to a different track because otherwise it's going to be playing back two different audio files. But you could probably, let's say if we extend this out. So let's say if I wanted to extend this. All right, I'll just start from scratch here. Okay, so let's say I could just take this 
file here. Let's extend it. And then once you have that extension, you could just do kind of a crossfade uh, between the two segments. So you could just, you know, do your crossfade. And then, so once you kind of have that tail kind of hanging over with, you know, adding, uh, so let's say if you wanted to, you know, just extend that over. So, you know, add the tail, extend that over. And then at that point, just do a crossfade between the two sections. But otherwise, it's going to, you know, get to the point where it's just playing this file and this file doesn't have processing. So, you know, extend the range of that processing with the tail and crossfade between the two. Okay, so we see uh, regarding bit rate, not 96 kilohertz, uh, but the export had 32 bit. Uh, what was that difference for that? So when we go through, um, let's say if we have 24 bit audio, and we could think of this, uh, an analogy we could make is, you know, maybe this is, uh, we could think of our mix engine like a suitcase. Uh, so if we have, if we're doing everything at 24 bit, we could have, and we've recorded the audio at 24 bit. We've now added a bunch of information, such as all of our automation EQs and plugins in our mix engine. So if we we're to export that at the same bit depth, um, we would almost have to kind of lose a little bit of the information to accomplish that. So we could think of that as a suitcase that is fully packed when you go on vacation and then you buy a bunch of stuff like clothes, little trinkets, you know, Christmas tree ornaments, you know, whatever, uh, souvenirs. And then you have to get that back into the same suitcase that was already packed. So you're kind of at the maximum resolution. So with 32-bit exporting and 32-bit floating point, it allows you to take your 24-bit recordings process it through all of the effects, EQs, dynamics, processing, all of the automation, and to not lose the quality of the addition of that processing. So we could think of like the 32-bit floating point as being more of like an elasticized or an expanding suitcase that could hold the new elements. And we could think of those elements as not as like little souvenirs and clothes, but as your effects and can maintain the original sonic integrity of the 24-bit recordings process without having to truncate or lose any of those particular files. So that's why we have 32-bit floating point for the audio engine and to be able to write to a 32-bit floating point file. All right, I have a question. I've updated uh, 10.5 Pro to 11 Pro, but no data from uh, 10.5 Pro is in 11. Is there a tutorial how to do an export and import all my personal data from 10.5 into 11? So all you have to do again is go to the edit menu and go into your 10.5 export a profile. Uh, go into a version 11, go to your edit to profile manager and import that profile. Reading through some more comments here. All right, great to see Charles K in the live stream. We 
me see that Yadin uh, does record directly. I guess it's the guitar directly into the interface. So. So if you're recording your guitar directly in, you know, make sure that, you know, see if the recording is fine without any of the plugins. And then you could see if it's a gain structure level of your audio interface and your guitar, uh, or if it's going to be uh, a gain structure level of your effect. And also in a UR22, you'll see one button that says high Z on one of the inputs. Make sure that you turn that on. And that would set the impedance so that it's optimized for like a line level output from a electric bass or guitar as well. All right, so uh, we see from Keith Peterson, is there a way to tell which plugins slash VST are CPU hogs as my projects get larger and latency becomes more of an issue? So latency caused by plugin doesn't necessarily equal or equate to the CPU usage, but if you have uh, a number of plugins on track, so I'll just kind of add some here. So let's... One way to, to see which plugins are causing latency. So let's say, okay, I want to go to a multiband compressor here. Let's go to maybe a squasher here. I want to go to a on this track. I want to go to, let's say convolution reverb. So one way to find out which plugins are causing the latency, and again, there's sometimes a correlation, but not a direct correlation between plugins that have high latency and plugins that have high CPU usage. If you go into full mix console, um, you'll see just this little, in the setup window, you could have channel latency. And as we look here, we could actually see uh, right above the faders will see these numbers and these numbers will indicate uh, the latency that's gonna be on that particular channel. And if you have multiple inserts, so let's say, if I just wanna come here and put in our multiband compressor on it, as we come here, we could see if there's multiple inserts, what the particular channel latency is in samples and milliseconds. So at that point, you could actually uh, see which channels have plugins that are causing a lot of latency overall. And at that point, you could just simply get a sense of, you know, what could be the culprits for causing your system to run at a higher latency. All right, uh, so it says, every time I launch Cubase Pro, it keeps telling me about the Mantra Voice and Urban Pop Vocal plugins. Uh, nothing I can do with it, something with the license. So those aren't Steinberg products. Um, so you may want to just, it's probably, uh, you know, you may want to remove those plugins. If you're not using them, you could uninstall them, but they're not Steinberg plugins. So it, they're probably a third-party plugin that's maybe, Maybe you ran a trial version or you don't have an active license or the license got deactivated on them. Uh, but I don't know their licensing schemes. They're not Steinberg based plugins. All right, so we see Randy Lee is going to try his US 24 which is a, a cool little Tascam 24 channel control surface. So it just kind of opens up as three Mackie controls. All 
or you see Michael Teams wants people to whack the like button. Let's continue to keep reading. Just finding my place, sorry about that. So, well, that's a great discussion of sample rates. All right, so I just see a comment from Sable Winters that IK Multimedia inserts white noise in their demo plugins. All right, so we see a question. Um, does Steinberg provide, us, provide for us contests about mixing or remixing or creations too? O occasionally, I know in the US we've done some of uh, done some contest on working with projects and had them kind of evaluated by high profile producers uh it could get to be kind of a legal quagmire for copyright issues and stuff like that so we haven't done a lot of those globally so i know they've done some in the past but they haven't done any in a while Okay, hello world wants people to smash the like button. All right. All right, so we see, uh, hello, um, uh, we see, uh, is there an option to use chord track to manipulate MIDI data? So yeah, let's go ahead and See if I have a project open here. All right, so. Okay, so let's say if I have um, a project here. So once we have uh, data, we could tell the different tracks to follow the chord track or not to follow it. So let's say I have just a quick song here. So I could actually come over here and just kind of type in chords. So let's say, okay, I want to start off maybe in a key of D. Now let's say I want that to go to E. So what this is doing is as I type in chords, it's actually changing all of my MIDI data in the parts. So let's say I'll just rewind it a little bit here. 
So let's say I want to do a quick turnaround here. And as I just kind of enter the chords in, all the parts will just kind of change. So if we look at all my MIDI notes here, as I go to an A chord, all the MIDI parts have actually changed. Let's say I want to make this an E minor instead. So that's one way that you can manipulate MIDI parts just using uh, the chord track. All right, great to see Pylon Records uh, back on the live stream. Thanks for joining us. Hope you're doing well. Uh, so we see, is there a way to time stretch audio files like in Ableton, specifically BPM, like 90 BPM to 120 BPM? So let's say if I just drop a loop in. Okay. All right, so really all you have to do is say, okay, I wanna take this loop. So let's say we're at 125 BPM on this drum loop. So all you have to do is just go to audio processes and time stretch. So let's just it's usually just kinda Let's see if I could just, just do it on our project here quickly. So select that, audio processes. Usually, it's not the interface isn't showing up on mine, but yeah, that's where you could do it. So try just going to, uh, and then you could do it by samples, BPM, or time. So just try going to audio to processes and then just do a time stretch. All right, so we see Steve Jones saying this is a great way to learn more about Cubase. Thanks, Greg. I had a good friend named Steve Jones. He used to work with Stevie Wonder for a long time, so. If that's the same Steve Jones, it's great to see you on the live stream. Okay, so I just see a uh, question. How do you drag an audio part in the arrangement view without moving the position of the pattern itself? So let's see. So if I wanted to hold down, if it's just making a copy, hold down the Alt or Option key. So me. So you could do that if we have also you know, if we're looking at this, we could also just hold down Alt or Option plus Control Command and you could slip the audio kind of within the event as well. But let me know if I'm misunderstanding. Um, 
So I'm just rearranging. So how do you drag an audio part in the arrangement view without moving the position of the pattern itself? So yeah, usually just uh, Alt or Option and just, so you could just kind of copy. So before you let go of the mouse, hold down the Alt or Option key and just drag. So if that's what you want to do, uh, this is from Chris Cass, but if I uh, misunderstood, let me know. All right, so we see from Mandy Lane, uh, my MIDI keyboard has issues working with Cubase 11. So generally, you know, all the MIDI communication is gonna be set up with, uh, through the operating systems for both Mac and PC these days. So if it's, you know, if you go to, let's say your studio setup and you see your MIDI port setup, you know, if you see it here, that means that the operating system is seeing it. Um, so, you know, so this is exactly what the computer's operating system is seeing. So there's no direct drivers with Cubase. So if your computer's operating system isn't seeing the keyboard, uh, then Cubase isn't going to see it. So um, Mandy, if you could let us know if it's, if you see it, if you go to your devices uh, or to your studio menu rather, to studio setup and click on MIDI port setup, if you see your MIDI controller there, uh, if you see it there, then Cubase should be able to see it. Uh, if not, you know, check in your computer operating system to see if you see that your MIDI keyboard showing up there. So sometimes it could be, you know, when I get this question a lot, it could be like, oh, it's an old driver. Like I had an original Oxygen keyboard that just wasn't supported past Windows 7 or something. Uh, that was never going to be updated. Uh, that happens and it's just, you know, the hardware itself. Sometimes it, if it's connected to a USB hub, you know, perhaps the, it's not getting enough power from the USB hub, stuff like that happens as well. So, but check those things out, Mandy. It's great to see you on the live stream. Okay, so we see from uh, Pylon Records, uh, Greg, the earlier version of Spectral Layers would allow you to get stems. Now it only offers unmixed vocals uh, before it would separate into drum, bass, and vocals. So, you know, if you're seeing only the unmixed stems, you know, so generally this works with, uh, you know, when we go to something uh, for a Spectral Layers edit, um, so I'll come over here to the audio, to extensions, you know, so you get Spectral Layers 1 with Cubase, but you also could have, uh, and if you have the Spectral Layers Pro, that will allow you to do that. So, you know, you can come over here and just see, like right now I have Spectral Layers Pro 8. Um, so check you know it could be that you know your license is only showing spectral layers uh one so check your license again so if you had like a trial version of spectral layers you know perhaps the trial has run out so spectral layers one will only allow you to unmix the vocals whereas if you go to uh the spectral layers pro and go to you know, your layers here, here you could choose to unmix stems and you have, you know, more options other than just the vocals. So, so make sure that you have, uh, that it's showing Spectral Layers Pro here under help to about as opposed to Spectral Layers 1. So if you have Spectral Layers Pro and Spectral Layers 1, then it will default to Spectral Layers Pro since Spectral Layers Pro uh, has more of the advanced features and we can think of Spectral Layers 1 as kind of a subset of Spectral Layers Pro that comes with Cubase, so.
Okay. Uh, so you see from uh, Guitar Lessons, Jay Ness. Hi, Greg. Is send a CC control uh, so that I can use a MIDI controller? So, you know, generally if you have MIDI, you know, let's, let me just add a quick, you know, let's say if I have a MIDI or an instrument track, you know, so generally if you have your MIDI controller, you could just, you know, move the particular knobs and one little insert that's really hel helpful for this is if you go to uh, the MIDI monitor and here you could, you know, once you open up that plugin on the track, anything that you're transmitting from your MIDI controller keyboard is automatically just going to be indicated here. So you don't, generally don't need like a send to that uh, but if i'm misunderstanding your question just just let me let me know but you know anything cubase will accept and capture any midi data that's being transmitted from your controller Um, so I just see a question. Um, does FL Studio and GarageBand have the same features? Because I'm on Windows and I want to make music. So they don't have the same features. So obviously Cubase is going to be kind of, you know, significantly a stronger program, a more featured program than either of those. Okay, so you see kind of a follow up from Mandy Lane. Uh, yep, but some, maybe it's a complete controller, but some weeks later the buttons and keys don't work, so I have to unplug it and back. So, you know, generally, you know, it's how the controller keyboard is working with the computer. So sometimes if you have to reset it, that's not necessarily a Cubase issue. Um, Okay, so question, uh, would I ask developer team make one very simple and useful plugin, pitch shifter, uh, absolutely useful in many genres. So I think I think there's one innuendo that probably should make it over called pitch driver, but let's just take a quick look. If I come, uh, let's see if we could do something with the pitch correct plugin. So let's say if I'm So let's say if I'm just playing. So you could just come right over here to in the pitch shift, in the pitch correct plugin. And you could adjust kind of the formants right here. So let's say, um, so you, you could do it like that, but also you could take kind of like an existing uh, audio parts. So let's say if I just go to this particular project. So let's say I'm playing this and I wanted everything to pitch shift down. I could just come right over here and just go to fine tune. half a tone flat or let's make it a half tone sharp so you could do it right there or just use kind of the pitch shift plugin so uh, so let's say if I put the pitch shift on the master bus here I haven't never really tried this in this scenario but I will You could also 
do form and preservation. So try playing with the pitch correct plugin because that could do stuff like that for you automatically. Or if you just want to select the audio files from the fine tune of the info line. All right, so we have a question. Some VSTs lose functionality when allowed to be resized on screen. Any idea why? So sometimes uh, if you're running like a high DPI uh, screen and a display set up for your computer, there's a lot of plugins that aren't optimized for high DPI uh, mode. So, you know, it's, it takes a lot of work kind of taking older plugins that weren't optimize for high DPI or retina scaling, you know, just kind of very similar conceptually on the Mac platform and you have high DPI on Windows. So sometimes they're not really set up for high DPI support. So that um, that could be problematic and, and run into situations that you describe. Okay, so we see, is there a key command to open the audio inserts and audio send sections in Inspector? Found toggle insert selection, but it's for MIDI inserts and toggle send section. Doesn't seem to do anything. Uh, so I think if we come here, let's see if we could save it. Uh, I'm gonna go do my inserts, and I think if I hold down command, that I can see inserts and sends. So, you know, and if I leave, those two things open, you know, I could just have those available right there. And let's see if I save this as a workspace. So I'm going to add a workspace. I'll just make it to this project. You could also make it global. So let's say. Okay, so now at this point, let's say I wanted to just see this and let's say for this project, I'll go to workspaces. So you could set up a key command for workspaces and you could save that as a global workspace so that at that point you could have a key command just to call that up. So once you have that set up and again, you could have two tabs open by you know selecting one and then selecting our one while holding down control or command and then save that as a global workspace. So wherever you're at previously, you can come right over here and you can go right back to your global workspace just like that. Uh, so to see question, is there any way for a potential customer to be given a grace period for the summer sale if bought today? Um, I know that Friday there is a license server outage. So I think that they were extending it and I could be mistaken, but you may want to just read online. But I thought that they were maybe doing grace period, maybe extending the license activation through August 7th, but you may want to read through the fine print. So you could check that out. Um, so you just see a comment from Andy Lane, laughing out loud, we got scammed by native instruments. Other people seem to have issues with native instruments controllers. I've heard a lot of 
issues with that from other users. Uh, so we see from Marcos, Marcos Gomez, uh, Greg, uh, if Steinberg do any contest, we have to use Cubase or Nuendo. Uh, I don't use neither, but because I don't not, but not because I don't like just because I own an air DAW since 2010, but I like Steinberg. Um, so if, you know, like they haven't done a contest in a while, but you know, part of the requirements for the contest was, you know, you would have to submit a project file. So, you know, we generally, you know, don't want to re, you know, it may not make sense to have a contest for your users and have someone use a competitive product, but we're glad that you love Steinberg and you like Steinberg. So we hope that you give Cubase a try. Okay, so it says, uh, when using multiple monitors, how do you lock a screen in place? And on top, uh, editor, for me, keeping off uh, screen when doing other things. So, you know, if you're using multiple screens, generally, unless, you know, like windows can open up, uh, you know, to be, you know, you know, so if you don't have other, you know, like a lot of people will just have their key editor, you know, on one particular screen that will be fixed there. And every time that they open up their key editor, so it will maintain kind of the same screen position. So if I just come here, um, You know, you could do that, but a lot of it, it, you know, used to be that there used to be kind of where you could right click and always on top for a lot of the editors, but the editor position uh, will stick. Uh, and a lot of people will use kind of workspaces. So, but if you don't have anything else opening on the second screen, so as you open up plugins, if you do it on a, on a screen, every time that you go to the edit screen, it will return to its previous position. Okay, uh, so we see, hi Greg, is there a way to duplicate backwards even uh, if I've selected the range tool? Uh, control D duplicates the selected events to the right. I would like to copy events to the left. All right, so generally no, but what you could do maybe is uh, if you put it, so say if I duplicate this part here uh, and I'll just switch to colors on this. All right, so we have like a white part and a red part. You know, once you do this, if you switch the grid to shuffle, anytime that you would just do, kind of just drag it over, um, it would just kind of flip those two events. So let's say if I drag this over. So some people will do that, but you know, generally, you know, duplicating it will go later in time which kind of makes sense, but if you need to kind of flip the events around easily, put it in your grid to shuffle, and you can do that with a keyboard shortcut, and then if you just kind of drag, those two positions will just kind of get swapped. And then, you know, you could obviously, um, let's say if I take it out of grid mode, you know, I could just kind of come right over here and hold down the Alt key, and 
sorry if I hold down the alt key this time. So, you know, I could just do it kind of like that, but generally the, it will, if you want to do it multiple times, you may have to kind of do it manually. Okay, so it says, uh, hi Greg, I imported a Pro Tools session. Uh, the tracks with uh, short regions all lined up at beat one. I read today that OMF type file export import would eliminate alignment issues. Um, so what you could do also is anytime that you have audio that's been recorded in another program, uh, let's see if these files are timestamped, but you could you know, it's, it's, you know, so you have OMF and AAF and those are always kind of better choices. But if the audio files have a timestamp, let me just take a look and we'll see if these files in this project are timestamp. But you could select all the files and just say move to origin and wherever these files are. So let's just say, okay, I, you know, wanted to move these files all to different locations. Um, at this point, I could just do select all and go to edit. And at this point, go to uh, move to origin. And that would just place all of the audio files directly back at their correct timestamp. So, you know, generally the programs will record like just a little bit of like where that file starts at in the time position. So as we kind of just come over here, we can see its origin time uh, indicated here. So instead of everything kind of being off alignment, you know, OMF is kind of old if you had the choice uh, exported as an AAF file, but if they're just giving you stems, just import them all and select all the files and choose move to and then to origin. So I just see a question. Uh, so in which ways an audio engineer can make money from his career? You know, you could have people who pay you to record because they don't have the, you know, the knowledge, equipment or expertise to do it. Um, so that's the primary way that people, some engineers, if you have enough notoriety, can get points uh, and royalties on projects that they do record. Uh, but a lot of times it's just kind of, uh, it could be, you know, for kind of getting started off, it's, you know, you get paid by the hour for your recording or mixing. So that's often the most common way. And if you, you know, develop a great reputation and you're doing a lot of major label work at that point, you could uh, move, you know, and start getting royalties and residuals and stuff like that. Um, so we see is Cubase Elements worth it for advanced production? Cause I'm going to buy it. So, you know, Cubase Elements is a great tool. You could do a tremendous amount of work in Cubase Elements, especially for, you know, the roughly $99, uh, that it costs. It's kind of what it is in the U S sorry. Just now I could do the birthday sing along at the office today. If I wanted to, um, I'll, I'll do this instead. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a great investment. You could always, you know, at that point, um, you know, if you've found that you out, have outgrown it or you need more features, just upgrade to Cubase Artist. If you need more features than that, upgrade to Cubase uh, Pro. But that will definitely, um, you know, you could definitely get a lot of work done in Cubase Elements. All right, so just see a comment from Cubase Junkie. It would be nice if Yamaha made a MIDI controller for Cubase with great integration and control. Yeah, I've been trying to get them to think about that for a long time, so, and I haven't given up, so. I 
you see Mandy Lange says, I put my Yamaha Motif off uh, my table and bought it complete control because it takes up less space, but it's buggy. Okay, so we have a question. I'll just do new project for this. So we have a question. Uh, is there a way to drag in a loop and set the tempo of the project? Okay, so let's say I just have a random drum loop here. So if I listen to the drum loop, I could say, and I'll just have my click track on. So we could just kind of listen to a drum loop and we could count how many beats is in the drum loop. So let's say I counted eight measures of four, four times. So that would be 32 beats. I would now come over here, go to the edit menu uh, and then, or maybe under project menu, and we'll see beat calculator. So I say this is 32 beats, and it's 140 beats a minute. So calculated the BPM, and I'll say let's import it at the tempo track start. And now my click is now set to match the tempo from now. So. Once again, just count the number of beats, go to your project menu to beat calculator, and that will automatically figure out the tempo for you. And you could import it at the selection start or at the tempo track start. You could also do a tap tempo. So if you just wanted to come over here and hit your space bar, you could do that as well. So. Okay, so we have a question uh, from Brian. Uh, Hi Greg, I use drums on demand samples. I can drop them into tracks and hear them just fine, but I cannot preview them in the file browser. Uh, is there a setting to fix this? So generally what you want to do, uh, if you're kind of auditioning the sounds, make sure that you have the uh, control room activated. And this may seem counterintuitive at first, but you want to, set the stereo out to not connected, go to the control room and you wanna add a monitor. You'll see add monitor. And then like I just labeled uh, like Yamaha HS7. So I just have that labeled and this is where I make the connection. And now I could audition any sample so, or any kind of drum hits right from here. So let's say Okay, I want to come over here to, you know, like drum one shots. I think if we, so I could say, okay, I'm just looking for toms and now I could quickly audition. And that's assuming that we have uh, the preview start kind of automatically on. So make sure that you have the control room activated uh, and then you should be able to kind of easily audition all of your different drum samples. Okay, so I see um, 
I paid $75 for the upgrade of Cubase LE to Cubase Elements, uh, but it's not upgrade. Do you know how? So, you know, generally with that, what you need to do is go into the license, the e-licensor control center. You want to make sure that you have your Cubase, you know, LE license here. Enter the activation code. Uh, and then that will look for your Cubase LE license. So make sure that, you know, we'll say, okay, we're going to find this particular license. Uh, and then this is the license, uh, this Cubase LE license that we're upgrading to Cubase Elements. And then from the Steinberg Download Assistant, download and install the program. But this is where you would do all the, the upgrading of the LE license to Elements. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, how to select multiple tracks in Mixer and copy and paste the same effects plugins to all selected channels? So let's add some audio tracks here. Thank you for all wonderful questions. So let's say we have 10 more audio tracks. Uh, go to my mix console. So let's say on this track, I have. Let's say compressor plugin. Okay, so I want to select all of these tracks. I'm gonna come over here. I think if we just go, let's see if I remember this right. So if I just right click here, um, Copy first channel settings, uh, and then I could come over here and oh, let me just, sorry, let's just come here to this. And try to remember there is like a little sneaky way of. You know, one way is just to come over here and let's say if we have the quick link on. So if you wanted to add the same so once the quick link is a, is activated, I could add the compressor across all the, the tracks like that. Um, and then I, I'm trying to remember there's, let me just make it a little taller maybe. So let's say if I copy, And I'll just select these channels. We could switch to our inserts. And then you could paste just like that. So you can copy and paste, but you could also just put it in quick link. And then if you wanted to put, you know, the, those plugins across all of the different channels. You could just add multiple of the same plugins across different tracks like so.
Um, so you see, how is it possible to record on this selected track even if there's an event selected on another track? Every time I try to record on a new track, it goes back to the track that has a selected event. All right, so let's say I have this event selected and I go to record. So yeah, you could do that, but it's, it could be a preference that is setting that. Uh, so let's go to preferences and maybe under project and mix console. Um, So there's, um, so it could be that like, you know, enable record on selected track and maybe coupled with another preference for like sync. Okay, so try under editing. Um, See if this is unchecked. So try track selection follows event selection. So now when I'm here, I get, let's say if I select this track, it doesn't select the event. But if that preference is turned on, we say track selection follows event selection. So now when I come here, I select this event, that track is selected. So try to disable that preference right here. So track selection follows event selection. Okay, so, um, all right. Okay, um, all right, so I just see from Andy Lane, what audio interface is best with Cubase? So, you know, audio interfaces are always tricky because they can, you know, it really, I always ask people, you know, how many inputs and outputs they need to record at once. You know, do they need MIDI? Do you need onboard DSP? How many mic breeze do you need? So depending on those settings, you know, um, I have been like, you know, I've been using the URC interfaces in my studio for a while. So everything that I've been doing on the live streams is through, uh, I have a Steinberg UR24C, but I think like the UR816C or UR44C or 22C is great. Uh, they have 32-bit uh, analog converter. So 32 bit integer converters, they have onboard DSP, they have MIDI, they're built like tanks. So those are really good choices and you have, you know, wonderful integration, uh, you know, directly with Cubase, but it really depends on, you know, how many ins and outs you need. So UR22 has two mic pre's, uh, UR44 has four mic pre's and six outs. Um, and then the UR816 has eight mic pre's and eight channels of ADAT as well. Okay, so we see from HP, can I ask questions in this chat? So yes, definitely just ask questions in the chat. All right, so we have Lawrence from Rhode Island. It's good to see you. I know you kind of were able to make it a little late, I think, in the Zoom meetup on Friday. It was good to see you. Yeah, so I just see uh, Cubase Junkies. I mentioned I have the Nectar Panorama P6. So I think I have the uh, the 49 key version, which I, I wish I had the 61 key version. So. All right, so we have a question. Uh, any piece of gear guarantees a full Cubase or Nuendo version, not a light one? So, 
there isn't uh, audio, there isn't any audio hardware that comes with the full version of Cubase. Occasionally there are, there will be like seasonal, like we often have it for holiday promotions. We do have a, like a Cubase recording pack. Sometimes that will get bumped up you know, with Cubase elements, um, but nothing with Cubase Pro that's bundled with hardware. So it's gonna be kind of sold separately. All right, so yeah, so you know, if you want to ask questions of the live stream, just uh, answer, just ask in the uh, in the chat field. So. Just catching up my Okay, uh, so I just see, sorry for hitting my mic. Uh, hi Greg, is it possible to create a macro that chops up a MIDI event, renders the renders these chops in place, and then reverses them? So generally sometimes macros, if it requires for a function to do, like after it's been processed, you know, you would kind of have to execute all the commands at once. So if it has to process something, but let's say if I wanted to uh, just do something like you described, so let's say, I, so I don't think we could do it in a macro because the macro, you know, would execute the reverse process before the files were rendered in place. So you might just have to, um, do it as all right so let's say I'll just but I think we could kind of automate the process for you all right so let me just change the sound here a little bit. Okay, so let's... So let's say, you know, but so let's say if we have this one note and I wanted to split it, um, I could just grab the scissors tool here, split the note. Or if we wanted to even just kind of come over here, I could split the note based on so hold down the alter option key. So then that could split the node. I could select all the events. Let's render in place. Um, so I'll do this separate events.
and then come over here and just process the reverse. So you, you could do it kind of like that. I know it's not a macro, but the macro would, you know, would start, you could start a render in place, but not then, you know, you'd have to, you know, the macro would have to wait until the rendering started. And sometimes you could do a small pause, but depending on how many events that you would render, um, but there's ways to make it faster. So it's, could, could be pretty quick. So sorry about that. Um, so you see from jazz dude, uh, is there any idea to make the elements a very cheap update from LE or AI, um, from the past, let's say $49 or so would be a lot of new users then. So periodically they do do that. So, uh, they will have a special promotions for LE users, especially maybe people that are on older operating systems and have an LE five that they could jump up to the latest version of LE for $10 or something or jump up to element. So at various times there's different promotions going on. Okay. So I just see a question. I would like to see some instruction on using Reaper as a slave with rewire for projects with a lot of tracks. Um, so if you need it to, you know, depending on your computer, rewire is kind of a, you know, maybe a technology that's not going to be around much longer. Uh, but, you know, if you have rewire, just come over here to your studio menu and you'll see under more options, I think you would see the rewire device. I don't think I have anything that does rewire anymore. Um, but if you have like the rewired driver, let me just see if it's, okay, so if you go to your rewire setup, here you could just, you know, have, uh, you know, you could choose the application, I think that would do rewire, and then you could have both applications going on, so, um, but if your system, you know, you're probably not gonna gain a lot by having a, another program playing back, you know, additional tracks on the same system. Uh, so, you know, unless you have like a, an inexpensive version of Cubase that has limited tracks, but you know, just it, it's gonna take more CPU resources to play some additional tracks in a different program running rewire than running those tracks in your version of Cubase as it is, so. Reading through some more comments. Uh, thanks for all the great questions. Uh, so question, any way to link the resources of two PCs in a local network, for example, RAM for loading more sample libraries? You know, so obviously uh, what a lot of people do is uh, run a common solution. If you wanted to, you know, over over ethernet is to have a, your different machine running VE pro and that could host different, um, that could host different VST instruments. Some people will also use VST system link that doesn't use uh, a local network, but it is, will connect via, um, you know, via, you know, VST system link will connect via digital audio connection. So like I was just said, uh, last week, 
uh, uh, I guess a week ago today, I was at uh, Ludwig Gorenson studio and they have all of their video machines running Cubase uh, with VST system link and then doing everything with the Cubase sync to that. So they have one machine for the video and one machine for Cubase and they use VST system link for that. So those are two common ways to, uh, to kind of spread resources across different computers. All right, so we see um, Christian D68 says 12 minutes before the first half to hang out. Come on, just seven likes missing. Let's go. All right, so appreciate that, Christian. All right. Okay, so I see from uh, Chris Cass is I kind of figure out what he wanted was the slipping of the audio. So I'm glad to figure it out. Okay, so we see from Helix, I just got Cubase Pro, super excited to get really familiar with it. Can you re reuse automation clips, like have a master automation clip? that the duplicates would follow. Um, so if you have, and it's, I think this is on by default, but let's say if you have automation here for this track, um, you know, and if you'll see from edit that automation follows events. So if that's turned on and we duplicate, you could just see kind of that same automation carried over. You could also select automation points, copy, come here, paste. So you could do stuff like that as well. So let me know if that's what you want to do. That's usually enabled by default under edit to automation follows events. Okay, so I just see um, my, sorry, sorry for that. Uh, my metronome is not working. Please tell how to enable. So the first thing you wanna do is make sure that your metronome is on and you can do that by hitting the letter C. Now often the metronome will get routed through the control room. So if you have the control room active, you gotta make sure that you have your metronome turned on, but it could also be deactivated from the control room right from this area under the main tab. So make sure that this is also enabled. Uh, usually when people is like, I see my metronome is on here, I'm just not hearing it, it will get deactivated in the control room by accident. So check those two things, make sure that you see the metronome on here, and you can turn it on and off by hitting the letter C on your computer keyboard, or you could just hit the metronome right here in the control room, and you could set the click level for the control room independently as well. Okay, so it says, uh, have updated from 10.5 Pro to 11, but there's no data, no settings, nothing has been adopted. 
Uh, can someone please give me a link for instructions how to get the data and personal settings over? So go to your edit menu, go to profile manager in your Cubase 10 or 10.5, export, and then from the same location in go to Cubase 11 and then import them. Okay, so I just see a question. Uh, how can I fix metronome issue with an incoming track at 104 uh, BMP, I, I assume beats per minute, uh, not being able to sync? So it could be that the original track wasn't set to, uh, you know, may not be actually 104 beats a minute. So that happens quite a bit. So let's say if I'm on a particular track here, we'll just jump back to this track. Okay, so. So, but you know, if it's not being able to sync, you know, there's a lot of times when people, you know, just don't have their tempos correct. So you may have to just come to the project menu, select the event and do a tempo detection. And that will figure out the tempo of your track for you. Uh, once you do that, you may, it'll place the time signature into one four on the signature track. Uh, we can now just come right over there, say, okay, hit four four at the downbeat. So if you know what the tempo is of the original track, it could be that the original track wasn't at 104. You know, if it's at 103.957 after a little while, it's gonna drift out of tempo. So just do a quick tempo detection and then you could have the metronome follow the existing, um, you know, follow the actual tempo, the existing track. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, when adding effects, what's the best way to make an instrument sound spaced out so instruments are not all sounding the same? So with stuff like that, you know, often panning, you know, can make a big difference. So let's say, you know, kind of classic things that people will run into, you know, okay, I have a guitar, uh, I have a keyboard and a guitar, you know, how do you make that fit? and not, you know, so you could carve out different frequency spaces uh, so that they're not clashing with each other. So, you know, and often think of subtractive EQ. So let's say if we take this song. Um, a musical history laid out on the floor. We played our records into the night. So, you know, the arrangement can make a big difference. So here we're gonna have, you know, guitars panned hard left and hard right. But let's say, okay, I wanna bring in So, you know, and as you bring in other instruments, so, so like the Mellotron's more panned in the center. And we'll have like a little piano part come in. So different frequency ranges, so make one a little darker, 
change the panning. And then everything could have its own little spot in the yard, if you will. You know, like a lot of times I think of mixes personally, like, you know, when I go to look at an instrument, I will often think of mixes as being kind of like on the piano keyboard where I need instruments in this range. I need instruments in this range. I need instruments here and here. And these could all be different instruments that aren't clashing. So it's not necessarily effects that could do that, but you know, you'll notice that like a lot of times, you know, arrangements, if a song is arranged really well, that the mix will fall into place a lot quicker. And many of the, you know, if you listen to, you know, let's say Steely Dan's a perfect example where, you know, the guitar player is never stepping on the keyboard players, never the, the guitarists and keyboards are never stepping on the horns. They're never stepping on the bass and no one is stepping on the vocal. And if someone does a fill, you hear it because no one else is doing a fill at that moment in time. So it's special. So it never takes away from the vocal. The vocalist stops, then you could do a little guitar thing. The next time it's going to be a keyboard thing. After that, it's going to be a horn thing. So, you know, arrangements are really key to making sure you don't have instrument clashes. All right, wonderful to see Gareth on the live stream. I'll try to get a picture to you today. All right, and great to see Graham Witcher on the live stream. All right. Okay. Um, okay. So I just see, uh, what do I do? I'm trying to record vocals. I got the Steinberg UR 22 C connected to a mixer, uh, the, a wireless mic station connected to the mixer by MIDI leads. All right. So, uh, generally, you know, MIDI isn't going to carry any sound. So you should just, you know, instead of having your microphone connected, into the mixer, uh, like a wireless mic, plug the wireless mic right into the UR22C. And you know you, you could just go directly in. Uh, so unless you have a really high-end mixer, you're probably gonna get much better results with the UR22C. So a lot of people in recording tend not to use wireless mics because they can uh, have dropouts and you know sonically, they can be not as strong as a, as a high quality microphone. It's wired, so it's pretty rare to use wireless in, this, in a studio, but you know, take the microphone and connect it directly to the UR22C. Um, so, and you know, MIDI leads to the mixer. You're not gonna transmit any of the audio from MIDI to it. So, you know, connect your microphone directly to the UR22C, add an audio track and hit record. Okay, and we see probably a follow-up says, uh, maybe I'm wrong about the concept on this, but because Reaper is easy in the CPU, I'm thinking it would be worthwhile to use it as a slave for music that has 100 tracks or more. So, you know, generally when people say it's easy on the CPU, it's not, you know, that's not playing back track. So you're probably going to spend a lot more of your CPU energy with two programs. So you'll be better just doing everything in Cubase. Okay, so uh, it says, I've got a question. My M audio keyboard can control Cubase, but it never actually records it. Is there something I've missed? Um, so you can set up MIDI controllers often to control transport as well as input. 
you know so when you go to the transport you may have it under like a generic midi remote um, and with this, this would control the transport. So make sure that you have, you know, if you have like a, or if it's set up for like a Mackie control, you know, make sure this is another way that many keyboard controllers will control transport through a Mackie control protocol. So make sure that, you know, you actually have, you know, this connected to the right MIDI input port. So you might have one MIDI port for control and one MIDI port for transmitting MIDI notes and make sure that these are set correctly for the control part. Um, so, and then, you know, make sure that A, you have a MIDI or instrument track. And then once you have that MIDI or instrument track that you'll probably see it route it to all MIDI inputs and that you have a sound loaded because if you just, you know, you know, if you just record data, you may not hear it until there's an instrument loaded up, but I would give that a try. All right. So we see Graham for, uh, is mentioning for people in the UK, there's lots of CC 121s in stock at Anderton's. Um, and also in stock at GAK Music. We see Tim Weinheimer is saying the Key Lab uh, Mark II series works great with his Cubase setup. All right, so I see, uh, please, can you explain something about mouse clicks that cause performance spikes on some systems configurations? Any solutions? Um, so I, I did have a, a client that had problems kind of with the Bluetooth causing uh, some interrupts, uh, like a Bluetooth mouse, which you, know, you think would be pretty innocuous, and he just kind of switched to a long USB wired mouse and didn't have any problems. So it could be something like that. It's usually not something I hear about, uh, but you, you could check to see if it's, uh, you know, if it's a wireless mouse, uh, if you, you know, can, if you have a USB mouse that you could work with uh, to see if that makes a difference. Yeah, so we see, uh, Graham mentioning like that Dom Segalis is, you know, about CC 121. Dom said his for 10 years. So uh, I think I got mine when it was released and still running strong in my studio. And it's, I got it in 2008. So it's 13 years. I'm just 14 years old now. Okay, so I just see uh, best way to mid side chain. So I think if we come over here, we could just, let's say if we go to our inserts, and let's go to our frequency EQ. So if we choose to come over here, let's say we go to band three, uh, we could choose for this, let me just put on a stereo track. Here. Okay, so at this point we could do left, right, or mid side. So if you wanted to just do uh, like side chaining on the middle part. Now when we come over here, uh, each of the bands can have its own independent side chaining. So as soon as we wanted to go to uh, like, let's say band three, so it's a dynamic EQ. 
and then we could just say, you know, band three, you could have its own side chain. So you could side chain the dynamic EQ and have each band be independently side chained. So give that a try. So if you want to do for mid side or mid frequencies, you could do that. Yeah, it was great to see you uh, for Korean Jesus. It was great to see you on the live stream on Friday. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we have Kenny Jobson checking us from uh, County Durham, UK. Met some people from Durham in the UK on vacation in Barbados, I believe. So. Okay, so I see from uh, Neurotic Nexus, never understood why the content loop sounds blast out of the output. So it really depends on if you come over here, you could just adjust the volume level for each of the loops kind of right here. So there's a preview volume. So you could set that independently for each of the loops. So if you kind of turn that up once, then you could it just adjusts the volume globally there as you're previewing loops. All right, from uh, Termo Nuclear War, uh, question. Uh, does Cubase 11 have some limiter which does not enhance sound much? So let's, I think if we just, you know, if you want to go to, let's look at the dynamics. So many people just kind of use the stock limiter for that. If you, you know, that's pretty, um, it's not a coloration type of limiter. Uh, if you wanted to also try different uh, limiters as well, you could go for the maximizer and use this. And there's kind of the classic mode. Uh, and if you want something a bit more aggressive, you could enable the modern mode. So we can think of this as more for contemporary EDM production. And this might be like kind of just a like We'll go to vintage 2000 kind of limiter technology, uh, but this would be more this algorithm for uh, more contemporary music. So between the regular limiter and then you could always just go for the straight uh, brick wall limiter as well as another option. So. Okay, so we see from Mark Rabin, great to see you on the live stream. Uh, Mark's in Montana. Uh, so I've got this weird habit going of opening up 11 Pro and just diving in, but the end result is an untitled dash 9023 slash directory with the typical project folders inside and it works fine. So when you're starting a new project, you know, it's always the one thing that I recommend to uh, a lot of people is just to, you know, it's really easy to say, okay, new project, create empty. And a lot of times it may just put you into kind of a generic folder. I just, and I think in Cubase 11, the default behavior of this changed where it'll ask you to prompt for project location. So this way you actually choose the particular folder. And I always recommend to people to choose uh, a folder that's kind of, you know, have a unique folder for each project and that will kind of make your life a lot easier so you could find stuff. Yeah, so I see Mark is saying, yeah, but later I have to open and dig through lots of folders to find that stupid idea I should have named on the instantiation. Uh, either way, if I rename the folder untitled 234 to best song ever, will this work? So yeah, and 
if you have like, you know, folders with different ideas, really, you know, the easiest thing to do is just choose a backup project, choose a new folder, and that will automatically move all the content over. And it's a very clean, easy way to do it. So. Okay, so we have a question. Um, how does one go about MSEQing in Cubase? And this is where we could get in, again into the frequency EQ. So each band of the frequency EQ, so it's an eight band linear phase EQ. Uh, so make sure that you put it on like, you know, not a mono track, but like a stereo source. And you could click here whether you want it to be one band to be left and right or to be stereo for each of the bands or to be mid side. So this way you could have kind of the left and right panning edges. If you wanted to boost those and cut them, you know, and cut out the middle part and you could have independent cues for those as well, even as the same band. So use the frequency EQ plugin Are you just reading through comments? Okay, read more through comment. Thanks for all the great questions. Okay, so I see uh, with the copy and paste of effects, could you do the same for a chain of effects with previous settings applied to the first selected channel? Yeah, there's a way of doing it. Let me just... Uh, I'll just do it on a new project here. See if I can remember. Okay, so let's say if I just want to let's see if I can remember Okay, so if I have all of my settings and I just grab it from here, um, I could just do that. And I think, so that's one way of doing it. And I think that if we do this, just undo some of these. So let's say if I have these channels selected 
Hold down the right modifier key. So if I grab it from the top edge here, Yeah, so you could copy and paste, and I think that there's a way. So, but if you just drag from here, you could take all the effects with their settings to other tracks. So if you just drag from the top, you could just do it like that pretty easily. So you could take an entire effect change. All right, so see Gant on the live stream. So I will have time to reply to your email probably later tonight, Gant. So sorry I didn't get a chance to. Yesterday ended up being a pretty swamp day. Just trying to find my spot. Sorry. Lots of great questions today. Okay, um, all right, so you see, hi Greg, this is uh, Piotr from uh, Warsaw in Poland. Can you show how to draw a gain automation on an audio event that affects the wave shape with an exact dB value? Okay, so let's come over here. Just... Okay, so let's say, you know, you always have your clip gain here. So if you just select the event, um, you could just do your volume. So if I just want to put, you know, 14, we could just do this directly from the info line. So, I mean, you could draw, uh, let me just move this up. So, I mean, you could draw the, uh, the time in if you want, you know, so you could have the pencil tool and the pencil tool was really just kind of a way of having quick clip gains. It wasn't, you know, originally this was called dynamic events and early, early versions of Cubase. Um, so like if you have a breath, you could just quickly kind of draw the breath out, you know, you could do stuff like that. And that was really the intention. And we took it away when we went to, this form of automation and people that were used to the old workflow wanted that back. So they brought it back and they kind of rechristened it. But here we can see that the waveform will adjust, but we don't see like the exact waveform value. But if we just come directly to like our clip gain, we could just say, okay, if I wanted to split this, let's say I hit shift X and now I've cut that, I could select right there and you just go to the volume and you could just say okay i want this up 6 db and you could do it just that quickly just from the info line if you wanted to so that's how i would do it
All right, wonderful to see Millard Brown on the live stream. So, sorry, you missed a giveaway of a 1959 Gold Top Les Paul original. So, just kidding. Anyway. All right, so uh, it says, hi, I'm uh, Miniono from Cameroon. Uh, I appreciate the new export window, Cubase 11, but when exporting an audio file, what to do to see the remaining time? Um, so, um, you know, I don't think it will indicate the exact uh, remaining time of the mix down, so it could change. You know, if, if you wanted to know the exact time, you could put real time export. But, you know, generally it's going to be faster than, uh, you know, what's going on. You'll see a progress indicator here, but not necessarily like a timer saying, you know, 32 seconds, 12 seconds uh, left to complete the export. So, but I'll, I'll pass that along as a suggestion. All right, so we see from Hello World, uh, will they have a promotion for Cubase users to upgrade to Nuendo? So I think it was in May and early June they had that promotion. Um, so maybe a little while until it comes back, but they did one just a couple months ago. So I'm sorry if you missed it. I think Jazz Dude uh, took advantage of it. Okay, so I see a question. Is there a reference uh, which Mackie control button in the option in the options corresponds to which MIDI note? Um, so there's probably not a particular reference, um, but probably if you're hearing MIDI notes, when you hit the actual Mackie control buttons, what you if you wanted that to stop because it's probably just sending out kind of maybe random MIDI notes, which is could be annoying, but come over to uh, the studio menu to studio setup and go to the MIDI port setup. And where you see the Mackie control, uncheck that from in all MIDI inputs. Uh, then the Mackie control will be kind of the Mackie control MIDI messages will be sent just for the control layer and won't be transmitted as MIDI note messages for a MIDI track. So, but um, you know, if you wanted to see what exact MIDI notes it was, you could probably, you know, maybe get the, uh, the protocol directly from Mackie. Okay, so we see uh, from Gant's question, uh, I have an Avion More Me headphone mixer. I always record in direct monitor mode. I could set up QMix sends in my control room and use those to send, but I can only create four Q sends. Um, is there a way to make the effect sends work as external outs in direct monitor? So what you could do is, so yeah, that's what a lot of people do if you need more than four Gant is uh, set up so let's say I wanted to add, um, not a chord track, let's, I'll just do a new project. So let's say I wanted to have 24 tracks. Of audio. And let's add uh, eight group tracks.
All right, and we'll just call this All right, so now once we have this kind of done and I want it to uh, just go to the sends, I could just take my audio. So I go to the sends and at this point, uh, I can say, okay, we're gonna send all these to Q1, all of these to Q2. And these are, in essence, just sending them out to the various Q mixes. And we could turn them all on. And then you could set the varying amounts of the Q mix. I'll just turn my quick link off so you could send, you know, this particular instrument to you know, this Q mix for different people. So that's a typical way when using kind of Avioms, if you need more than four Q mixes is you could just have it set up through the sends, um, just like that. And then I think with this that, you know, once you have that set up, you may have to do, I think you have, uh, if memory serves, I think what you said in the email was the RME uh, card. I think it's a Maddie card with the uh, antelope as the front end. And you would just kind of set up the routing in the total mix for that, uh, for these groups. So these groups you could route out to... Uh, other, you know, other outputs. So let's say if we have another eight outputs here. So I'll go to my studio connections, my audio connections rather. And let's say our outputs. And at this point we'll say, you know, Q1 out. Q2 out. So as we work with this, we say, okay, Q1 is now going to Q1 out, which is whatever outputs are then feeding the Aviom system. And then we have Q2 out, you know, whatever you want to do, and then set the uh, routing here to the outputs that are connected to the Aviom system. All right, so I just see uh, from Volker, screen is not clear enough. So I, I think generally if it looks a little fuzzy on the receiving end that it could be uh, more, you know, maybe try refreshing the web browser, but often that's based upon the speed of, you know, what it, on the receiving end. So sometimes setting up the, you know, you could set the YouTube settings for, you know, best for your speed. So. All right, so we have another stupid question. How to get a film composer contract? A simple, short is fine, thanks. So, well. You know, get to be friends with film compo with people that make films. Um, you know, it's like goofy stuff. Like, you know, many of my friends in LA, it's just like, oh, I knew someone from someone, and you know, they just, oh, my girlfriend knew his girlfriend, and you know, they gave me a shot. And you know, people get started in really kind of dumb ways like that. But you know, like I always thought it weird in college when you know, like our music department was in the same building as drama and dance and fine arts and realized that we all could work on projects together in a lot of ways. So it was, it was good to meet all those people. So, but you know, you just have to, have to convince someone to pay you to do it. So. All 
Okay, so we see where are Cubase icon assets stored? I'm setting up my touch uh, portal button actions with ping, uh, like .png images and hotkeys. Um, so a lot of the, you know, these are kind of fixed. Uh, like, you know, these, if it's these types of icons, um, there isn't like a repository of like the different program icons. I've tried to get it myself for similar purposes. I'll ask again to see, you know, if there's, you know, sometimes they may have it in documentation or something, but I'll ask again to see if there is a, a way to do that, mm -hmm. to get all, kind of all the program icons. But I had asked earlier and it's just like, oh, it's just kind of tied into the GUI of the program but I'll try to ask some more people. Okay, so I just see, um, thanks for showing the automation follows the event feature. Greg, can you have an automation event that copies and copies of it that would auto update when the original one was edited? Um, so let me just, Okay, so let me just. All right, so I'm going to come here. Let me just try this. I'm gonna hit Control or Command plus K. Then I'll do shared copies. Let's say I'll do four shared copies. Yeah, so I don't think that there's a way to do it because it's kind of the automation isn't event based. Um, you know, you can move the automation with it. Um, but you could always just kind of copy the events again. Um, so but we can think of the automation as being more linear. All right, so we have a question from uh, Brian Sawyer. When importing a MIDI file, it opens up a track with Halion. I move the info to the track I want, uh, but I cannot remove the Halion Sonic uh, tracks. There's no remove when right clicking. So if we come over here, let's go to our VSTI instrument. So when it loads it up, it's gonna load it into a rack and you'll see a Halion Sonic SE instance here. Um, so what you could do is where you see the Halion Sonic SE in the VSTi rack, just come here, click on the name and choose no VST instrument and then it'll be removed. So once again, just click on the name. And then as we do this, no VST instrument and that will, you know, take care of it for you. And uh, one other thing on the MIDI file, Brian, if you don't want it to automatically do that, go to your preferences under MIDI to MIDI file, and you'll see destination, and you could just choose this to MIDI tracks or instrument tracks, and as opposed to loading up the Halion Sonic SE multi-timbral. Okay, uh, so it says, a question, I have a mixing session on Cubase 10.5 Pro. 
uh, all audio, 51 tracks, everything is in sync. But after adding a few plugins on a few tracks, the beat starts to go out of sync. Uh, what could cause the problem? So I think that you'd probably be able to find that it's going to be one plugin. Some, sometimes, you know, plugins will report their latency to Cubase and sometimes it's not totally accurate. So sometimes plugins will tend not to do, will not report the correct values for delay compensation or, you know, as you're adding, you know, different plugins may cause more uh, you know, so it could cause more delay. So I think if, you know, you could probably isolate it to a particular plugin and some plugins just kind of don't report their latency correctly. So. Okay, so I just see my Cubase LE 9.5 waveform is not visible. Uh, how to fix the issue. So if you don't see waveforms, uh, one of the things that you could do, um, you know, the waveforms will be stored as images. Uh, you could try going to the pool window. And let's say you go to the audio file and we'll kind of just scroll over. So see if you go, you'll see like an image and you may come right over here. Uh, and let's say if you don't see like the little waveform image here, I think you could right click and um, like I think there's a generate thumbnail cache. So try that, you know, make sure that, you know, it could be sometimes people may have the amplitude down really low by accident, but if the waveform image cache is wrong, try again, try going to the pool window and, you know, select the files and choose to generate thumbnail cache. Okay, I know we had a lot of questions that were mailed in. Let me get to some of those. Thanks for all the wonderful questions. If you've learned something new, make sure that you hit the like button and that you subscribe to the channel. All right. All right, so I was talking to um, Peter Frampton sent me, called me up with a good question yesterday I wanted to share. Uh, so his question was how to do a loop of MIDI information that's independent of the project timeline. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So I'll do a new project. And what he wanted was like a MIDI drum part to just kind of repeat over and over uh, while he was coming up with uh, ideas for a new track. All right, so I'll come over here. Let's add just like a, a quick groove agent. Okay, so I just wanted to have one little pattern here. Okay, so when we double click on this, I'm going to turn off uh, my actual zoom, my actual loop locator in the event. So let's say I have this file and I wanted this pattern to kind of play over and over again while the song moves on to try out different ideas. So you want to make sure that we go to the settings and that you have the uh, independent track loop enabled. So go to the settings wheel in the MIDI editor. So I'm going to just move, I can see my independent, I'm going to move the left and right locators just around those four measures. And once that this is the independent track loop has been activated, I'm going to turn this on. So as we look at this, I could just say, uh, we could watch the main timeline. So it will be in sync now. And as we move on, the main timeline is going to continue to play. 
Let me just get my, sorry, my, get this turned on again. Sorry about that. forgetting to do something but at this point we could kind of set the independent track loop here let me just Okay, so now I just drew in this region. So you see this track loop. So now when this part ends, this editor will keep looping over and over and over again while this continues to play onward. Let's get to our main window. We'll see that this is just continuing to play on and on while these four measures are just continuing to loop. Okay, so the other question mailed in. Um, so three questions slash feature request. Uh, last solo selection recall. I don't know if there's a way to reactivate solo on all tracks I have previously soloed. Uh, so they're, they're currently in the mix window, you know, if you go through, um, you know, if you want it to, let's say if I solo a number of tracks, so I, let's just add, I think I have a little quick template that we could show here. Just show this here. Okay, so you know, if we wanted to, let's say if I was going through and you know, soloing different tracks as we come over here, you know, one of the things you can't do is, and we could see this in, let's just come over here. You, you could do a, you know, as we're working, you know, with different solo states, you could take snapshots. You know, there isn't a way to automatically undo or recall every track that was at one time soloed. And I think that could be problematic for a lot of people. Uh, but you know, you could take snapshots. So let's say if I wanted to come here and I have, you know, these tracks soloed. Uh, so say I take a snapshot and let's unsolo those particular tracks. So if I wanted to recall the snapshot at this point, I could just say, um, I want to recall, and here we could choose that I wanted to recall only the so you know, states. So let's say if I come here, I guess it's not included in the snapshots. So I'll pass along, but it doesn't currently do that. 
Um, all right, so we have a mirror pan grouping option. So if I move the pan to minus 10 on track A, it'll move the pan to plus 10 on another track. So I think, let's say if I just, I don't know of a way to do that, but let's, if I choose to link, you know, so it, this isn't going to automatically do that and you know it's often why we would use a stereo track where you could use the combined panner that we showed earlier um so another question uh option for subgrouping tracks example in a guitars group having guitars one and two and three and four sharing independent selected control so if i have this let's say this is guitars one and two so at this point, I could just, you know, link these particular channels. So I will come over here, add a link. Let's link these two channels. So as we want to come over here. Okay, so we'll call this link one. Okay. So those can be linked. I'll select these two channels. And we'll call this link two. So these can all be going to the same group, uh, but linked independently like so. So you could have different link groups laid out like that. Okay, question. I uh, have a question about Hertz and how or if we can change the master frequency for a song. I want to test creating songs in 30, 432 Hertz and 520 Hertz, not because I'm a conspiracy theorist, but I just want to run some tests with binaural beats in my songs and see if it truly does make a difference. So far, I've tried to pitch shift plug in, the Deer VR plug in, and many other routes, but nothing has actually been successful. Thank you. So I would say if you you know, want it to take a whole project and, you know, down tune it to 432, uh, which is, you know, there's lots of great web videos on this. I'm not a big proponent of the concept, but if you want to accomplish this, you know, so you could come over here and say, okay, we're playing along. And if I wanted my pitched instruments to just transpose down, I could just select those tracks and on the actual, so if I want to tune it down eight cents, I could go to the fine tune. And now that's, instead of being tuned at A at 440, this is tuned at A at 400. So if I jump back, let's say if I hit enter, we'll see if all the, everything aligns. It, So it's a minus eight. So to me, it's not like a huge difference, but you could do that. Now the problem is most MIDI devices won't necessarily carry over uh, for that. So if you play an A, the A could be at 400 or 440 versus 432. So depending upon the instrument, so let's say if I jump back to this project, you know, if you're doing instruments like, uh, you know, Howling and Sonic, stuff like that. We could now come right over here. Let's open up the instrument, but here we could just choose the master tuning to 432 so that your MIDI stuff will be based at 432 as opposed to 440, but not all MIDI instruments will allow you to do that. So if you're just recording audio, you know, just tune your audio, tune your instruments to 432 and record it into Cubase. Cubase isn't gonna pitch it up or anything like that. It'll just capture whatever the tuning is. You know, Cubase will, re will you know, if someone sings out of tune or in tune, Cubase will capture it, you know, uh, pretty effortlessly, you know, regardless. So, but it's when you get into MIDI stuff, you may have to go into your instruments and tune the instruments, but most of the Steinberg instruments will allow you to do that.
Okay, so we had a question uh, last week from Taylor about the copyright symbol as metadata. Um, so like when we go to make an MP3 tag and Taylor was kind enough to send a project over. Uh, and his question was when we come uh, to do an export audio mix down, let's say we do our ID3 tags that Taylor had basically written in a copyright symbol here. So I think it's just uh, option or alt G. So let's say it was something like this and we're going to Okay, so, and then once we would export, I will come over here and I'm just gonna add that to our queue. So we're gonna add this ID3 tag for the MP3. Um, and I'm gonna store it to the desktop and we'll call it MP, we'll call it the August 3rd copyright symbol. Some mobile, all right. So we'll add that to the queue. Uh, so I'm gonna export this as our MP3 file. You'll see in just a matter of seconds, we'll have this. And the problem that Taylor ran into and in a lot of media playbacks, you know, that, and when we look at this, we'll go to my desktop uh, here's the MP3 file. Let's say if I do it inside of, inside of, uh, group, inside of groove agent that you know, if we watch it inside, we'll often have this little a right before the copyright symbol. Um, and it's because I did a bunch of research on this and it seems like maybe iTunes isn't capable of reading. It's only doing like Unicode characters. Uh, but interestingly enough, if I take that same file and load it into another program player, I, I realize that iTunes is way more popular, but you know, it's not necessarily reading the metadata correctly with special symbols. Um, so if I go to my desktop here and let's say I, I open this with WaveLab and we go to look at the metadata inside of WaveLab, that we'll see that we'll just have the copyright symbol here directly indicate it uh, under like the album field. So many different playback systems don't work with special characters in the metadata and can add stuff. And this is common not with just Steinberg programs, but many other programs as well. So you may just want to write copyright with that if you don't want that to be carried over to those particular uh, music distribution services. Okay, so we have a question from Jan. How, to, uh, how do I pull all the used samples from external drives, cloud, et cetera, into my audio directory in my project? So anytime that we would add an audio file, let's go to our pool window here, and we'll see that my project, when I come over here, this is my project folder. It's gonna be under projects, hangouts, and I just have it like for August 30th. So as I drop, audio files into my project and I open my pool, we can see that the path has automatically been put directly, not from where this location is, but directly into the location of where the file is. So if we want it to do this, what you could do is come over here to preferences and under editing audio uh, on import files, try selecting copy all files to new pro to or copy all files to project folder. Then all those files should be placed uh, directly into the folder, your project folder for you.
so we see, is it possible to delete or overwrite a patch in Cubase VST instrument, Halion, Groove Agent, et cetera, on a Cubase presets for a plugin by mistake in case how to recover a deleted or overwritten VST instrument patch or plugin presets? So most of the time, you know, you could modify, let's see if I just come over here to uh, this in here and let's say if I just want it so um, so it looks like if you saved it yourself what's gonna happen is if you save the preset, it goes into, let's go to the home area. If you save the preset, the original presets will always be uh, in the, so let's say if we go to our VST instruments and I wanna go to pad shop, I could see all of my VST presets there. But if we've done user presets, I would just come over here to the user presets area and then go to the VST instruments. So it gets, anytime you make a user preset, I think it'll just automatically get stored into the user presets as opposed to overwriting the particular file, uh, the factory preset. All right, so question, I uh, have a challenge with the drum editor. If I select two instrument tracks, example, bass, drums, I expand a lower window to open two separate windows, one for bass, one for drums. How do I combine? Uh, I want to be able to edit in the drum editor, easier to see drum parts to match bass lines or pianos, et cetera. Also, uh, when I set up a groove agent, uh, should, I, should MIDI be set to groove agent or no map? No map, the MIDI lines don't read like the drum patterns. I can make it work. If I don't expand the windows, all the parts will work there and I could change from the drop down bass, groove agent, piano, and when all are selected. So if you have, you know, so let's say we'll just take a look. Um, so if I have a groove agent pattern here and we've told Cubase to, um, let's say we'll just select the track here and we have it set with a drum map. So let's say we're, we create the drum map from the instrument. So now when I double click, it's gonna take me there and it's gonna click and take me here. So if I select both of these, these will be routed to different drum parts. Um, so these are kind of like two separate editors. I'll select both of these uh, and then I could edit kind of, you know, I could see the colors or I could see the drums will be, um, so at this point, uh, let me, I just switched that, that sound. So you may have to, you know, choose which editor, but you can't, you know, if you're going to do it all in the drum editor, it will, you know, take it all into the drum editor. So you can't necessarily have a drum editor and the, um, and the key editor within the same screen. So they're going to be working as two separate editors. So if you don't have it, if you set it to no drum map here, so let's say, okay, I no drum map. Now when you double click, it, when you select both of these events, you can go directly into the key editor, uh, you know, and kind of click on the one that you want to actively edit. But if you, you have the drums going, you know, they're, they're both gonna go to the same editor, whether it's a drum editor or a key editor. Okay, so let's say I have a we have another question. Um, how to hide, not just minimize unused channel rack components from the mixer windows. Okay, so let's say we have, we just uh, add a number. Okay, 
Okay, so let's say we go to our mix console and we look here. All right, so when we go to our racks, um, All right, so it says hide, uh, not just minimize the unused channel rack components from the mixer window. So if you actually click here on the racks themselves, you can pick and choose what elements are visible in the racks and which are hidden. So it's not minimizing it, but you could, so again, just kind of click right up here in the racks and then you could pick what exact racks you want to see visible. Okay, and we have a question. Um, uh, so question, having mixer one, two, and three, remember the horizontal divider position in the visibility configuration. All right, so let's say if I come here, let's go to mix console two. And let's say I have this all the way over to the left and I'll mix console three. Okay, so when I come over here, we could just see that. Let's get a mix console too. So we see our, our dividing line here. Let me just. So that's preserved and let's. All right, and if I save this project Okay, I'll close this project. We'll see if those are recalled. Let's take a look. So it looks like that line, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, but that line is, seems to be saved with the project. So, all right, and we had two different questions for this where people want to see the knobs in this EQ. Um, so there, you know, when we activate the EQ here, it's going to be kind of slider based, but if you just come, uh, you know, a lot of people don't know that if you just click in the EQ area here that you could access, uh, many of the EQ functions and the, and the keys that can, you know, restrain direction for Q, uh, boost and cut. All right, so we're just about out of time. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for the great questions. We will see everyone back on Friday, starting at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern Time. Uh, we hope everyone stays safe and healthy, and please uh, take care. And if you like the live stream, learn something new, make sure you hit the like button. Thank you very much.